Um, tonight, what I wanted to do was show you a few examples of how feathers have been used in the world of fashion. Uh, it is interesting that the birds, of course, grew the feathers in the first place, and that was about function, but about attraction as well. And then the human species decided to uh, co opt uh, the, the goods and turn them for their own uses, which is, again, about trying to look good one way or the other. So um, we're going to do the program in two sections. We'll work for about 20 minutes or so, then we're going to take a small break. Then uh, if you have a chance to go and look at the artwork, I think that would be a good idea. And then we're going to come back and deal with the things from the 1930s and uh, into the more present day. As the uh, months come by, uh, I'm grateful that we managed to set it up this way to get a good look. But looking is better than touching. Very much. I want you to understand that we're, we're friends at the moment, we all want to stay friends. Thank you. I can get new friends, can't get new clothes. <laughs> Could we have a first episode? Now, there are sort of rules, traditionally rules in the world of fashion as to what is um, uh, important. And sexual attractiveness is a truly important issue. But there are other aspects that are important as well, and they include things like um, financial uh, status, trying to prove, prove that you're wealthy on it. Actually, can you go from the middle there and then come back to it, just to get the first look here? Um, Mackenzie is where I now think it would be, which would be appropriate for the mid part of the 1890s. I'll show you the rest in a moment. The important feature for us tonight is the cake. I bought that cake at a shop in Gaston called Cabbages and Cakes uh, quite a few years ago now, uh, operated by a man named Stephen Lippold. Um, I don't know where Stephen got that cake, but I walked in one day and that was there. I've never seen anything like it. As far as we know, it's pheasant feathers. I, of course, should have had someone here uh, on staff in the museum uh, talk to me about that first, so I can say it with conviction. But it has, it's, um, it has an iridescence to it in dark greens. Copper color. The feathers have been overlapped as they would appear on the bird, so the whole surface is nothing but feathers. It actually has a very spongy texture to it, and you can understand how warm it would be. So it is about uh, luster, it's about catching the eye, it's about richness, but it's also about comfort. You have all of these things happening at once. I would like you to see the dress though, because if we're just going to talk about accessories, it's sort of uh, takes away from our function, which is really talking about the history of clothing. Now, we'll get you right back to a little bit further down to the second scene of the world. Right. This black silk satin is going to be somewhere between about 1894 and 1897, thereabouts. This is exactly the kind of formula that would have appeared in fashion anywhere in the fashionable world. And by that, I mean it could be London, Paris, Berlin, or Vancouver. If you look at the local photographs, it's exactly what women were wearing at the time. She is supposed to be seen from the front or directly from behind. That's because they want to make her waistline look as small as possible, and you use an A-line skirt with five petticoats in it and big leg of mountain sleeves. So you want lots of volume and emphasis on the shoulder line at the hem. This is going to make the waistline look smaller. And if you look at birds when they are courting, the angle of perception is part of this as well. And we'll always see that little dance, that display. Same thing happens in the, in the human world. Underneath all of this, there would be a shift, bloomers, four petticoats, a, a corset, a camisole, and another petticoat. That doesn't include the stockings or whatever you use to hold them up. Her hat, when you come by, I got in Powell River. It's dark green velvet with nets and beading and so on and so forth. But when we pick the hat that was going to be here at the um, Museum of Biodiversity and whatnot, I wanted to pick something that was going to be about the animal kingdom. We're going to do a lot of feathers, so I thought here we could do without the feather. That ornament is a beaded snake. Complete with red green eyes and its little fork tongues sticking out there, and it's guarding the apple. <laughs> the garden of Eden. Okay, I'll get you coming up. Alright, thank you very much again. Like a um, down-filled ski jacket, things like that. 
number from 1900 to about 1905. In that period, this is really the ballet pop, so the 1890s, the early Edwardian period, this is about display. It's about trying to be impressive. The men of the hour were the important businessmen, men who were wealthy and therefore important, seemed to be important anyway. And the reality is that, generally speaking, those would be men who were a little bit more mature, and therefore their women were supposed to be more so immature as well. So the look is complementary to a woman who is a little bit older. That means between 35 and 45. <laughs> That's what a woman was considered to be her most attractive. At 35, she was still a girl, but at 35, she was really immature and therefore more appealing. I'm going to show you the outfit as well. Now, what she has on here, I'm going to get you to stand right there at this angle. She's wearing, this is, these are all chicken heads. So there's what they would refer to as a tippet, which is a small, just a small shoulder uh, uh, sort of yoke with tassels on the end. The cape will get you from the back. This kind of cape was worn all through the 1890s and through to about 1906. It's an assortment of white satin, silk satin ribbons held together or sewn onto net, all pulled in and lined on the inside, and then trimmed with more uh, chicken feathers here. The blouse, uh, this I can't remember where I got it. The skirt here came from the Frederickwood Theatre at UBC. Over the last 30 or 40 years, every so often, someone who's been in charge there will get you come down on that. Uh, whoever's been in charge of wardrobe has invited me to go and go through the collection and pick things which are not usable in the world of theater because they're too small or too fragile, and I've been allowed to take an assortment of things to use in these kinds of programs. So that skirt, which was probably originally part of a wedding dress, was without its bodice. So it's perfect for us because it's uh, uh, probably combined with uh, blouses, waists, and what have you. This particular blouse is made of Battenberg lace, which is a handmade lace made of tapes all sewn together by hand. At the end of the 1890s, they changed the way corsets were built and the kind of underwear, that, the, the amount of underwear that was needed, and they wanted something that was going to show off a nice flat stomach. We're going to get there trying to see, so we're going to have to do it again. We have to go down there and do it with this. And then come back to it. Now, the stomach is flat, they changed, they're building a course in here that creates a nice flat stomach, but they want it to be that much more pronounced. So what they do is they bring the rib cage forward. And I'm only making this point because this is another bird reference. She's going to wear a, a, a ship, a corset, she's going to wear a Boston Kruger, which is a series of ruffles that goes inside the underwear across the bust here. And then she wears a camisole over that, which is all gathered across the front, and then a blouse that will do the same thing. And it creates the impression of a bird's chest. This is called a counter pigeon chest. And you see the bird, you see them in the streets, the little pigeons and their proud, proud chest. This is the human version of exactly that look. And the idea, of course, is pretty much the same. Hey, look at me. In reality, of course, the birds need all those muscles to help support the wings and fly. All right, so we're going to give you this back. The fan that Becky is wearing is also more poultry feathers, and that belongs to the grandmother of my friend Leonard McCann. If any of you know Leonard, that is the former curator at the Vancouver Maritime Museum. Leonard's family moved from England to uh, China in 1862. Leonard is fourth generation Caucasian Chinese. That fan belonged to his grandmother in Shanghai in about 1900. Thank you, Becky. Grab the next one. Now, we are at that Titanic period now. And this is the period, this is the Titanic went down in 1912, of course, but the aesthetic is developed in about 1909, and it stays popular until about 1912 or 13. Excuse me. I don't know how many of you have this horrendous cold this morning around, but I can have an extra on it now. I think we're going to walk down to the second scene there, if you would, and then come back to me. Now, 
Same is wearing an outfit here, which is going to be 1910 or 1912. By this time, the political time, climate was changing for women. In most countries, uh, they were making a lot of noise about being included in the federal and national votes and so on. And certainly, uh, in Canada, that was, that was part of our history as well. She's wearing a black lace coat, all embroidered by machine. Um, technology is amazing. We tend to think that uh, we're uh, um, uh, the only generation that ever did anything clever, and it isn't true. The coat came from Valley Village at Edmonds Wood. It was $15, just to make the point. Her feather boa, now I have to show you at least one feather boa. People tend to think they're always from the 1920s. This one is actually somewhere between 1900 and 1910. Again, it's poultry feathers, uh, rooster feathers probably here, and they are iridescent. Now, black was always very important to the Victorian and to the Edwardian world. It uh, uh, is formal. I'm going to get you to go all the way down again here. It's to show black, and you might as well do this as well. We'll get you to go down there. Um, black, and particularly the black in uh, crows and things, a lot of times, uh, natural black feathers were used in millinery uh, for feather boas and things. Black was always the most expensive dye. You had to use huge concentrations of black in order to get it to be truly, truly black. And in most cases, if of a black color fades, it will become green or brown because that is in fact the color that the, is the basis of the dye. So it had prestige, it was expensive, it was dignified, it was seen as appropriate to mature people, uh, and of course associated with, with wealth. Um, the, by this time, the, the garment is becoming more simplified because of this idea of physical liberation. So the dress is in fact clear of the ground. This is a, about liberation. This isn't having a train that you have to control. It's not about the wear and tear on the hem of the dress. This is about efficiency. And if you can see the front of the dress through the coat, the waistline is actually high. What they're doing is drawing attention away from the whole figure and more and more to the face of the person wearing the outfit. The place where you see intelligence, character, personality. These are women who, trying, who are trying to prove that they are capable and responsible voters. Part of that formula is to, is to use enormous hats. The bigger the hat, the more remarkable it is. It becomes the focus. And in fact, in some instances, it is the broadest part of the figure. It is the dominant design feature. It is what you notice. And therefore, you notice the face as well. For those of you who are aware of Jeff Wall's photography and artwork, um, Jeff did a photograph that, uh, that was inspired by one of our fashion shows, and basically this is the outfit, different hat, mind you, but this is the outfit which is in that photograph, which is now at the Art Gallery of Vancouver, so when you are there, please check that out. Thank you very much, Cindy. Foreign to Western eye, it will be the new kind of look. Again, it's about passing. 
passivity, the weaker and more vulnerable the female appears to be, the stronger and more necessary the guy gets to feel. Perhaps much more abbreviated, it is in fact a turban. I got this from a woman here who bought it in Texas. The ornament on the front is, a, is the head and feathers of a bird of paradise. Now, the feathers that were on the hat that you just saw that Cindy was wearing were also all bird of paradise. Very beautiful, very diaphanous. On that photograph right there, there are close-ups of bird of paradise feathers. There are, I believe, this is a dangerous thing for me to say in a room full of academics, but at one time I read a book that said there were 23 different kinds of birds of paradise. In that period, from about 1910 through to the beginning of the First World War, they were hunted mercilessly. People would have paid fortunes and often did pay fortunes for those feathers because they were very beautiful, they were exotic, and of course as time went by, they were harder and harder to get. So the price went up. So the slaughter became even more remarkable. So here we have a copper-colored head here, and the feathers are sort of bronze, copper colors as well. I have to invite black, green, and I don't know what other colors they came in, but certainly in various shades of brown. The stole that she is wearing is marabou. Marabou is a water bird, it's like a, some kind of a crane, and these are very downy, very soft feathers. And in fact, there are lots of, of uh, domestic fowl as well that are used in, in lieu of real true marabou. I'm going to get you on your way now to a place. Now, years ago, I was talking to one of the fellows I worked with at the Museum of Vancouver, and he was not interested in old frocks, I can promise you that. But he was generous and open to learning new things and whatnot, so we were talking about uh, women's fashions and feathers and so on. And I said, um, I had a hat, and I said, well, do you like this hat? And he said, yeah, that's fine. He says, but that is one. I said, yeah, that's Meribur. And he looked at me and he said, I'm sorry, I don't know who that is. He thought I'd said very boo. <laughs> so there's a bird that we have to accept as it is. Maybe have the next time. Uh, Sophie's wearing another marabou stole here. This is about 19, somewhere around 1922 to 1924. In Canada, women got the right to vote for the first time in a federal election in 1917, provided they had, the women had a male family member in the armed services overseas who could not vote for himself. She could have his proxy. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this was a beginning, it was a bit restricted. The following year, they changed the law, so from then on, women could vote in Canada, provided they were 35 years of age and owned property in their own right, and in their own name. So that changed the concept of what it meant to be a woman. A woman had a political voice, and as soon as that happened, the importance placed on her physique disappeared. She didn't need to display a whole body shape in order to have a social value. So in fact, the body disappears entirely. For the first time in history, the entire weight of the garment rested on the shoulders. I'm going to get you to go down and do that again to you and come back to So here, instead of displaying the figure, the figure is understated. The dress came from Victoria. It is a silk georgette, which is a very lightweight crepe. It's supposed to, because of their fantasy at the moment, their concept is that it should look like a, a tunic worn in ancient Egypt. They think she looks like an Egyptian temple dancer. This is because in 1922-23 they opened King Tut's tomb, and it became exotic, and Egyptian was fascinating. So in the ancient world, they of course didn't have corsetry. They had loose tunics or wraps or skirts or what have you, and that's what's going on here. They are still keeping it feminine because they think they are making the garment loose enough that she looks like a little girl and dress up in adult clothing. She is supposed to be swamped by the volume and looseness of the dress. You have the action that we just looked at with all the tightly corseted dresses, 
and the reaction where you have a garment which is absolutely loose. If a little girl is wearing an adult garment, it's going to be long. And this is still comparatively long. The waistline, which would have been slightly high before, now drops to the waist, or to the hips, I mean. I'm going to get you up here and I'm going to take this from you just so to show you that. The hat is now too big and sits really, really low on the head. She would conceivably have bought her hair by now. When I was working at the museum, we had, on two different occasions, the daughter of an elderly woman bring in her hair that she cut off when she had a fight with Dad. And she went downtown, and this was here, she went down to Georgia or something like that, to the hairdresser and got her hair cut off as a sign of rebellion. The mother was moving into a senior's residence and the family didn't know what to do with the hair, but they couldn't throw it away. And they thought the museum might be interested. And of course, we were absolutely fascinated. This is uh, proof of, of social history. So now the hat will sit really low. The idea here is well that she is able to peer out from under the brim of the hat, and this will be provocative. It will catch a man's interest. The beads are also too big. The cliche of long last strands of beards and beads in the 1920s is because of this concept here. And semi-precious stones were more important than precious stones, again a reference to the ancient world. The color combination is also supposed to be part of that. You would see her legs, but you would never see the skin. That was just too much to expect for a radical change this early on. So the skirt was scandalously short, but it was relatively modest because she was in fact covered up entirely. Thank you, Sophie. Now I'm going to get you to walk two thirds of the way down and come back to me. Jennifer is wearing a coat here uh, from the late 20s. This is our late 20s outfit. This is our last outfit for the first part of our program. The coat looks like a uh, beaver fur or some other uh, kind of fur. It is, in fact, the skins and, and um, baby feathers of nestling rhinoceros fox furs. You're supposed to know, ooh. <laughs> this person over here is my best friend because she did. She went, ooh. <laughs> that is exactly what, uh, what I, I think, too. I think, ooh. Now, the reality is, um, uh, well, first of all, I'll tell you how I got it. I got this from uh, the uh, collection of a man named, named Lloyd Cook in Victoria. Lloyd and two other people had a vintage clothing store um, called Deja Vu in Victoria, and they had put together three different collections that they used to um, promote the store. They would have fashion shows and promote them. When they went out of business, each uh, two of the three members of the, of the team uh, sold me their collections. And this is one of the things on Lloyd's collections that I very, very much wanted. It is very unusual, of course. Our uh, rhinoceros hawk is a uh, bird from the from Hadawai. And the uh, uh, hibernation people used to catch the, the nestling birds in the nest and kill them and use the skins to create warm clothing in the wintertime. It is a very functional concept. Uh, when they were building the museum uh, up in Hyde Hawaii, uh, the curators and researchers came to see me because they had heard about this technique. They had never found an example of it. This, they were confident, was that, but they didn't want it for the museum because it's not a traditional piece. It's fashion. So I was really relieved in a way because I didn't want them to have it. I, I felt really bound to give it to them, but uh, without um, it being precisely what they needed to illustrate local history, uh, I got to keep it. Um, it is unbelievably soft. It is also unbelievably vulnerable. The suit is a way, I'll get you to go down there and come back to me, is a wool gabardine. It's uh, actually from California. A friend of mine got it for me at uh, uh, a flea market in um, uh, San Francisco, I think it was. And this is the end of the 20s when efficiency and, and, and abbreviation becomes the norm. This is the kind of suit that you would wear to the office 
uh, to perhaps go shopping, to go to the lawyer's office, something relatively formal in the middle part of the day. A hat very much abbreviated, close to the head. This is about the modern woman having a modern, efficient outfit. Her stockings are opaque, cutting to match the outfit, so there's the impression of nakedness, but not actual true revealing closure. Uh, the shoes have a tea strap to them, which is classic for the period. The handbag belonged to a woman in, um, in Penticton. It's an uh, alligator with her own monogram and certain silver. She was actually an Irish woman that lived in London, so the handbag uh, actually was bought in London, but she um, retired to, to Penticton. The um, sweater underneath is hand knitted um, rail. Rayon have been around in an experimental form since the 1890s. Thank you, Jennifer. That's the first part of my program. So, we need about 10 minutes to change everybody into their second persona. Safely, I, I tell them, you know, it's all right if you don't be on the mat. So, uh, that's why we need those two moments, so if you'll excuse me, we'll see you in a minute.